Hey, I'm Lauren Bird. Welcome to About That, the show that explains and expands on the news. Today, we're going to talk about alcohol. So it turns out T-Pain and Jamie Foxx are right. You can blame it on the alcohol. Certain cancers, heart disease, and other long-term health risks, that is. Because what we found out last week through some new guidance from the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction is that the amount of alcohol that can cause long-term health risks is actually a lot less than we thought. Our main recommendation is that people who use alcohol should consider reducing their alcohol use as much as possible. That's Catherine Parody. She's the Interim Associate Director of Research for the Centre on Substance Use and Addiction. And she co-chaired the scientific expert panel that put together the new guidance. Now, what she just said, like, we've heard it before, right? Drink responsibly, everything in moderation. We know that. But what is new is what we actually consider to be moderate. So the new guidelines, they refer to a continuum of risk. Basically, every additional drink could mean more potential problems. So if you have one or two drinks a week, you're in what's called the low-risk zone. You'll likely avoid any alcohol-related consequences. But anything more than that, and you start to put yourself at risk for more long-term issues. So, get this, three to six drinks is the moderate risk zone. Your risk of developing some types of cancer, like breast cancer or colon cancer, it increases. And seven drinks or more in the span of a week is considered high risk. And you add on an increased risk of heart disease or stroke. And every drink past seven, well, that quote radically increases the risk of alcohol-related consequences. And I'm just gonna let you think on that for a second. And remember, those numbers are drinks per week. Seven drinks a week, is one drink a day. The guidelines also say that having more than two drinks in one sitting also increases your risk of harm. So this is a big change, right? Especially from the last guidelines, which were published more than a decade ago when women could safely drink 10 drinks a week and men could drink 15. In the past 10 years, there's been a, a lot of evolution in, in, the, in the field of alcohol. We now have a much better understanding of the relationship between alcohol and several diseases. If you're sitting there thinking, like, whatever, I'm here for a good time, not a long time, I get it, really. But Catherine Paradis says there is some good news to be found in these new guidelines. For any Canadian who would uh, want to improve their health or their well-being, there's a quick fix. Reduce your alcohol use and you're going to be experiencing benefits from that on your health, on your well-being. Okay, so it actually says zero drinks a week has its benefits. Like better health, better sleep, and who couldn't use a better night's sleep? But come on, it is a lot easier said than done. But there is another effect of drinking less. There's also going to be uh, improvement on, on, on the risk of, of injuries uh, and on some types of social harm. We looked at violence, you know, and there's something in this society where we kind of take it for granted that when people drink too much, you know, they may become violent or verbally abusive. Um, I've worked a lot on campus where unfortunately there's a lot of sexual violence. Well these things are not a given, like they should be avoided. And, and if, if generally, if collectively there was a reduction in alcohol use, we would see a reduction in those types of harms as well. That's a really important point. When we talk about alcohol and health, we usually focus on the impact it has on ourselves, but we often forget there's an impact on those around us too, because alcohol is a social thing. So full disclosure, we talked about this about a month ago, just before the holidays. We took a deep dive into the world of non-alcoholic drinks, their rise in popularity, and we wanted to know if this was a sort of golden age for those options. Okay, spoiler, it's not. But we did have a lot of fun learning about the different options out there and trying a few along the way. And you can find that episode on CBC Gem and YouTube. But something that kept coming up was what we just talked about. 
how alcohol is so closely tied to our social lives. To talk about this, I want to bring in my producer, Christina Romualdo. She produced that previous episode on non-alcoholic drinks. Hi, Christina. Hey, Lauren. So we've been talking about this basically since we met. It yeah, was pretty much <laughs> the first story that we did together. And um, yeah, like it really struck a chord with a lot of people. But I guess what I'm wondering now, seeing this, this two drink limit, um, are we like killing fun? It, it kind of feels like it, doesn't it, right? Like, when we think about the fun events in our lives, like hanging out with friends, hanging out with family, when you celebrate a birthday or a holiday or a Friday or a Thursday, right? Like, those are all alcohol-related in some way, and it's a pretty key ingredient. And, you know, when I was researching that episode, I... I noticed it and I really wanted to find out why is alcohol so tied to fun. Um, so I thought I should probably ask an expert and the expert that I ended up turning to was, uh, as you know, Catherine Parody. I mean, alcohol is, is, is a product we use in Canada uh, uh, to mark time off. It's, it's a substance that really marks the difference between the weekdays and the weekend, between the ordinary and the extraordinary, between work and leisure. So it, it, it has that function. It marks something special. And so another thing that Catherine said was, you know, there's actually a physical feeling that we get to tell us that what that drinking what we're drinking is special and it's that buzzed feeling that we get after drinking alcohol that yeah. we're all familiar with um and you know when i think about what catherine just said i remember the first time that i told you that like the whole alcohol is a marker between the ordinary and the extraordinary and i think uh, like when i told you and I, I told a bunch of people on our team as well and a few friends I, it felt like every single time i told that I told that to someone, it was like, it was, it was like it, the moment had clicked, right? Like you, totally. it, it, you, it was an understanding of like our relationship with alcohol. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it in terms of, in terms like that before. When we think about the relationship of alcohol and, and that time off culture, like it, it makes it hard to not drink, doesn't it? Yeah. Like and just, absolutely. Like, and one of the things that Catherine talked about when she was talking with me was, um, you know, alcohol is a bit of a weird substance because it's one of the only substances where it's weirder to not drink than it is to drink. When we talk about stigma, we talk about stigma for those who use a substance or use it too much. But for alcohol, it's a complete opposite. Uh, if you don't use alcohol, it's almost as if you, you need to come up with, with, with reasoning to explain yourself. You know, if, if you're a woman, you can say you're pregnant or, or, or you can say that you're on, 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 on taking some medicine. But it, 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 it's quite fascinating that the, the, the burden of the explanation falls on the one who is is not drinking. And I think that coming up with excuses to not drink is something that a lot of people can probably relate to, right? Absolutely. And, you know, we, I just talked about, you know, alcohol. Alcohol helps you mark the fun events in your life, but you're also celebrating those events with people. Like, alcohol is inherently a social tool. And, you know, there's, there's a group experience that you want to be a part of. You want to be part of the celebration. You want to be part of the experience. But when you start not drinking or you want to drink less, the question becomes, can you be, still be part of the experience without alcohol? Right. Because it's hard to imagine those events and experiences with, without it. Um, like I grew up uh, in a house, my, my parents didn't drink, so I wasn't around it, but um, it was still really pervasive. Like I still saw it in, in movies and you know what? It looked really cool. Your drinks are... Lucky I asked for a change. Promise me this is not the last time we're going to play poker together. Absolutely not. We'll just have to make the time. Of course we will. Growing up, and this is going to sound really cliche, but growing up, for me, the adult uh, kind of show that I wasn't allowed to watch was Sex in the City. While Samantha had little belief in the idea of happily ever after, she had a very strong belief in the idea of a smart cocktail at the end of the workday. You know, maybe that contributed to like this mysterious kind of air of like, oh, that's what a cool grown up looks like. But to me, that that what for a long time that was what a cool grown up looked like. Like she had this cool job, which now I realize is not a great <laughs> representation of journalism. Um, but she had this cool job. She hung out with her friends. Uh, she met guys and had this fabulous life. And 
she drank Cosmos throughout the entire thing. Right, and let's be honest, Carrie Bradshaw wasn't sticking to a two drink limit. No, she absolutely <laughs> was not. <laughs> yes, I'd like a cheeseburger, please. Large fries and a Cosmopolitan. Like, are we actually gonna change? Honestly, when it comes to people our age, probably not. And mm -hmm. the way that one of our, our colleagues put this, and it really stuck with me, was, you know, for people who already have a relationship with alcohol, it's, it's like telling them to drink less is not really going to cha change their, uh, change their behaviors. What it probably will take is something personal, something that happens to them, or something that happens to, their, to a loved one, to make them reevaluate their relationship with alcohol. And for me, you know. I turned 30 a couple of years ago, and uh, I honestly, when I turned 30, it was kind of like a light switch had gone off, and it, whenever I'd go out to drink, it felt like the hangover was so much worse than before. Like, it would be 24 hours of me in bed being like, why is this happening to me? Um, and it just, over time, it just got to the point where I'm like, this isn't worth it. You know, I, I like being able to get up on a Saturday morning and go about my day, and so I, I started drinking less. Yeah, and I think that switch flipped for a lot of us. Yeah. <laughs> but the consequences, you know, as we're seeing now, they're so much greater than um, a hangover, right? These are long-term consequences. So but the thing is, it's hard to imagine changing today for something that's, you know, maybe 20 years in the future. Right, and that's the thing is, like I said, it's probably not gonna amount to a change in our generation, mm -hmm. but it'll probably impact younger generations, our kids, grandkids, if we choose to have them. Um, and the thing that I think about, you know, is cigarettes. I will <laughs> Smoking, it will suck the life right out of you. I was 15 years old when my mom passed away. If my mom could have seen into the future, she wouldn't have begun smoking because she's never going to uh, see me graduate. She's never going to be at my wedding. All the important stuff, she won't be there. It's hunting season, so this is probably pretty stupid, right? Actually, hunting accidents kill somewhere around two people a year in Ontario. Smoking kills 16,000 a year. So, what's really stupid? And the thing is, like, those really stuck with you as a kid. And I, like, I can't think of a package of cigarettes without thinking of, you know, that damaged lung. lung. Yeah. And if I think about, I know if I think about, like, the people I hang out with, or even just going out, I think there are a lot less, there are a lot fewer people smoking than there were years before. Um, and there are actually numbers to prove that. So Statistics Canada um, looked at this and they found that in 1985, Canadian, the amount of Canadians smoking was about 35%. By 2020, it was down to 10. Wow. And you know, it was a gradual change, but it was a decrease across all the years. And that's the thing is, it's gonna take time. It's not an overnight thing, but change does happen. So I think labeling and those ads or effective. Right, and um, putting warning labels on alcohol is something that this expert panel is actually pushing for. People are willing to have that conversation. Um, they, they want to learn more about the topic, so let's help them do so. And the first step may be by uh, uh, making mandatory standard drink labeling on alcohol containers. So at the minimum, People who are interested in this new guidance, people who would like to assess in which risk zone they are, could count the number of drinks that they are taking on any occasion. And if those cigarette ads did work, I mean, presumably there might, like change might be coming for younger generations. Totally, and you know, that's pretty much all we can hope for. Awesome, well, Christina, thank you, as Thanks. always. Thanks, Lauren. We're going to take a quick break when we come back. If you're looking to cut back or talking options with a non-alcoholic distiller, we'll see you in a minute. So who's buying stuff like this? Like you would, anybody. And it's super interesting. And sometimes it'll be people like, I have regular customers who drink 
two or three drinks and then switch. Oh, so it's like even alcohol drinkers sure. would order. Yeah, it, to pace yourself through the night, like if you're out with a bunch of people and you want to like keep being social and carrying on, um, you just sort of switch in the middle. Um, it's super common and they've started to sell often enough that it is, a, it is a useful and profitable thing to have on your menu. Hey, welcome back. So you saw Andrew there talking to Alexi Thibodeau. She's the co-owner of a cocktail bar called Henrietta Lane in Toronto. And that was a clip from our previous episode on non-alcoholic drinks. Alexi mentioned something that kept coming up last time, that more people are choosing to drink less. And that's for a range of reasons. And we found out that non-alcoholic -alco cocktails, so drinks that look fancy, just don't have any booze, they help some people realize that you can still be part of the celebration without the alcohol. That was something I talked about with Bob Heidema. He started Sobri, a brand of non-alcoholic spirits. We met up with him for that non-alcoholic drinks episode at the distillery where he makes his products in Stratford, Ontario. So tell me, how did this begin? How did you get into doing this? I got to a point in my life where I was looking for actually I'll turn this to alcohol, even though I didn't know that. So I put it, I always put it in an easy terminology, which is I love cocktails, I hated hangovers. So I look for a solution. What, um, what do you think it is bringing people to, to this product? One of the common areas, and the common area that I saw in the UK when I did the research, there's a health component that drives people that makes them sober curious. So there's something about reducing alcohol that there's an instant effect on their health, generally improve, obviously improving it, uh, whether it's better sleep, whether it's uh, all kinds of other issues that can have inflammation. Uh, the other thing about it is, you know, not the, the health is driving to one side of it. The other side of it is just what I said before. Um, I've seen it stated as that basically people are looking to avoid the adverse effects of alcohol. They don't want hangovers. So basically they're looking for alternatives to reduce their alcohol consumption. And like myself, you need a viable alternative to actually make that happen. Water's been around forever. People don't actually want to choose that. If you're in a social setting with your friends, you want to have drinks like they have, you need a viable alternative to an alcoholic drink. And I think that's what's helping the market in terms of driving people into it, is that there's more and better uh, varieties of these products. Right, so it's not necessarily about not drinking at all, but having a decent substitute. Yeah, what I've seen in, in terms of, uh, again, the research in the US, it's moderation that's driving the sober, the sober curious. It's not abstinence. Who, who's really driving this trend? Like, who's really getting into non-alcoholic cocktails? Yeah, I think that's a really good, that's a really interesting question because you often, you want to, often you get asked in terms of demographics, which one it is. It crosses all demographics. Mm -hmm. The driver is health. So people have some sort of wanting to improve their health. What's happening right now is that the early adopters on this are generally, uh, you know, people in between the age of 25 and 45. So it's a, it's a, it's a probably a millennial from a demographic standpoint. And women are driving the experimentation, particularly in the non-alcoholic distilled spirits. So they seem to be the first ones to, to get interested in it, to find it, to try it, and then become sort of the regular users. Is, is there enough product out there for, for the people that want it? Well, basically, uh, the research that I've seen suggests that the household penetration of non-alcoholic products right now is 5%. So there is a lot of opportunity, a lot of, of different, you know, people have different ideas of what they want in a non-alcoholic alternative. Um, so I think more competition is good in terms of building the awareness of the category so that people know that there's options out there. Right now, it's a lot of experimenting, a lot of new products on the marketplace, um, but is there room for more products? Absolutely. But 5% penetration, there's a lot of room to move up. Is this a trend? Is this uh, a fad? Is it? The golden age of non-alcoholic drinks? I, again, with the, with the amount of household penetration, it can't be the golden age yet. We're moving into that. You know, the other side of this in terms of the drinks business is the whole, what we call the on-premise or the restaurant side of business. They've been slow to pick this up. They've been slow to get onto the trend in terms of that their guests want non-alcoholic options. Uh, in the UK, when I was there in 2019, again, they were, it was, it was a, a large variety of, of menu options that you had for non-alcoholic drinks. It's slowly coming to Canada. It's picking up in the United States. So there's a lot more opportunity. Um, we're not there yet. So what's the difference then between here and the UK? I think the UK has uh, a much more um, innovative cocktail culture. 
And it's something I experienced when I was working in the alcohol industry as well, that they are way ahead of the game, in particular London. Um, they enjoy their cocktails. They're, it's a very, very, the pub culture, the socialization of that is much more intense than here mm -hmm. and obviously much more concentrated. So you get a lot more innovation. And, and the trend started there maybe, maybe three, four, five years ago. And it's, again, it's slowly coming here, um, but I think they're more innovative. It's funny you say that. Like I lived in the UK and I found the same thing. It is a, there is a lot more pubby culture. Um, so I guess to get to that, for us to get to that point, um, for non-alcoholic drinks, what what needs to happen? Well, I think it's one of the things that what we're doing right now. It's, it's building awareness that this category actually exists. We did a we did a national uh, women's show in Toronto in early November, and we sampled 3,500 people. And the responses that you get about, oh, I never knew this existed. I didn't know something like this exists. It's, it's, it's probably a good half of the people that come up to experience it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that building that awareness uh, will help a lot. So it's, you know, and, and more competition helps that too. Um, but people understanding that there are alternatives and there's viable alternatives that they can have uh, is important. Because w drinking is such, it can be such a celebratory thing, right? We, we use it, you know, a glass of champagne or a cocktail. You still want to feel that you're part of something, even if you don't maybe want to have a drink. And I think that's, that seems like one of the really appealing parts of non-alcoholic drinks to me. Certainly, we try to, we try to maintain the same ritual. I think, I think the tradition and the heritage behind, and, and certainly, you know, alcoholic products and cocktails particularly, it is about socializing. It's, it's your, you're around a group of friends that you want to have share, shared experiences and shared fun times. And I think with, with what we can do with non-alcoholics is essentially give you a similar experience in a similar type of glass and a similar type of garnish that you feel part of the group. It's inclusive. It's really, it's really including everybody uh, that may have been left out, uh, you know, in years gone by because they don't have the options or drinking a glass of water is not the same as having a, a uh, cocktail that's non-alcoholic. Stick around, we'll be back with a final thought after this. Hey, welcome back. So we've been talking about the new guidelines for alcohol and health. And, you know, I think it's tough to see these new guidelines come in that are so drastically different from what we've been told was safe for so long. And some of us might be thinking, you know, I've had a glass of wine every night for the past 10, 20, 30 years because I was told it was okay. And now you're saying it might mean I have a higher chance of getting a cancer or heart disease. And maybe if you're a certain age, you might feel like that ship has already sailed. So will cutting down even make a difference? And it might be hard to think about making that change. But the thing is, how much a person wants to drink, it really is their own choice, right? We decide what level of risk we're comfortable with. And that's kind of what these guidelines are saying. It's our choice. And on the other hand, Having the option to choose something else, something that still allows you to take part and stay connected and maybe stay a little closer to that guideline, it's pretty cool to have that too. I'm Lauren Bird. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.